Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at our Terrace IP with Kurt Schuler, who's going to talk today about the three P's of ISO 26262. Kurt, there's been a lot of talk about ISO 26262. The whole automotive market is exploding right now. What do people have to think about when they're starting to design ships for this market? Okay, uh, Ed, one of the things that we're seeing uh, is you have the complexity of the automotive chips increasing, and that's usually because of uh, what we call computational consolidation. So think of a whole bunch of MC, uh, MCUs uh, split all over a uh, car and a whole bunch of different systems and little mini ECUs around the car. That processing power is being concentrated into SOCs, and then there's sensors tying directly into those SOCs, so you're seeing this comp computational consolidation. So you're getting very complex chips that way. The other way is with ADAS and autonomous driving. Uh, a lot in the news about that, but as you know, there's a ton of processing going there, basically supercomputers on a chip that are making decisions based on sensors within the car and even outside the car of what to do uh, for either safety purposes or for actually driving the vehicle. So those are the two trends that are leading to these very complex chips. Now what that means is there's a lot of semiconductor engineers and design teams who are relatively new to automotive and when they hear about ISO 26262 it's kind of overwhelming and confusing. And what I've tried to do is kind of uh, simplify it into three different areas that a designer or a engineering manager uh, should look at and to consider as they're going through for the process of what they need to do. So what are we looking at here? So what we're looking at is ISO 26262 is a, a huge specification. You're looking at nearly 2,000 pages of guidance, actually a little bit over 2,000 pages of guidance. What you have to do is understand, okay, what's actionable? What do I have to change about myself or my team or my process uh, to create a chip in automotive, especially one of these complex uh, chips? And so what I've done is broken up into people, process, and product. These are really the three uh, big areas of ISO 26262. One of the big mistakes that people new to the industry make is focusing solely on product and what they're doing to the technology um, and what they're doing with the engineering to get it accepted or be able to be accepted by their customers. And they don't often pay enough attention to the people and the process aspects of ISO 26262. So what changes with the people? Is this a standard engineer or do they need extra training? The short answer is yes. One of the big requirements in ISO 26262, and when you have assessors come in, either third-party assessors, uh, this would be companies like Exceda or uh, SGS2 SAR or uh, one of the other twos, uh, they're going to come and look and they're going to say, hey, what's the safety culture? What do people already understand about um, how they do things on a daily basis and how that can impact uh, the safety of the product? So if you've ever been through uh, some of these uh, different uh, quality type assessments, they're looking at the same kind of thing. It's not just do you have the paperwork for it, but do you really understand it and have you been trained enough to understand it? And the rationale here is that if something goes wrong, they want to be able to go back and figure out where the problem was and correct it, right? The, the, the whole thing is based upon, you know, you're going to have to always try to do the state of the art in your practices. And that is a continuous improvement process just like any uh, quality management system, that's what QMS stands for up here, any quality management system is a uh, continuous practice. But it doesn't matter unless, one, that you've been trained on what you need to do, and two, that you're actually living what you've been trained on. And that's really the point of the people standpoint. So one of the things when uh, assessors come or when customers come and talk to your design team, they're gonna ask, well, who, who's been trained either in quality management or who's been trained in ISO 26262. Uh, the good news is you can get training for your employees. Uh, we've done that with our company. We've got over 50 people uh, trained and certified uh, in ISO 26262 as functional safety practitioners. How extensive is that training? How long does it take? Uh, the, the training is actually uh, for just this, uh, the initial level functional safety practitioner, and you're looking at four days of training plus a closed book test. So, and this is the, when I say four days, I mean four days, eight hours, actually a little more than eight hours every day of training. Um, one of the best ways to do it for your team is to have the training company come and deliver it either, we've done it at our, our new offices here in Campbell, we've also done it 
um, in a uh, hotel suite where you know you have 25 or 30 people come. Uh, that's usually the best way to do it because you get more interaction. You can send individuals to the different ISO 26262 trainings. Uh, in the United States, a lot of them are in uh, Silicon Valley, and there's a lot, of course, in the Detroit area. So let's move on to process. What happens with the process? Obviously, the, the, some of these chips are, are no longer sitting at 60 nanometers or 130 nanometers. They're now moving down at the 10.7. Yes, yes. And with the increase in the complexity of the chip, people are looking more and more at the total design process. And ISO 26262 does that. Now, as people in the semiconductor industry, we're already really good at uh, using systems to track, here's an engineering task, here's something that was implemented, and oh, here's the verification test for that. And we're really, really good at that loop. What in general, most semiconductor companies are not as good at is, oh, and here's the additional market requirement, the uh, product requirements that are in use cases that derive from that. Uh, oh, here's the specifications. Now here's the implementation. Now here's the verification. And then here's the quality assurance. There has to be traceability through all of that now. So that's something that uh, a lot of people who are have been in semiconductor before but are new to automotive, haven't experienced that. This is something that the um, aerospace industry has dealt with for quite a while, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this is something that um, aerospace, medical devices, um, uh, now anything with uh, any amount of uh, automation that could actually hurt people, in including cars. Uh, so it's becoming more mainstream. But what, what it does mean for people in semiconductor is that you have to have an ISO 26262 uh, compliant quality management system that you're actually doing and living. And so that in the past, uh, you may not have had to do that. And um, one of the things, the first thing to understand is what is an ISO 26262 compliant quality management system? A lot of the advanced processes were not developed for reliability, which you're going to need in autonomous vehicles and safety critical type of markets. What has to change from the verification side? Uh, how do we go about making sure that these chips are actually going to work for the length of time that they're supposed to work for and under the most uh, extreme conditions that you can possibly imagine sometimes? Well, that's something that's happening more on the product side of things and the technology that goes into the products. One of the big things on the ISO 26262 working group, you know, we're getting more and more information on, for example, transistor aging and how that works at seven nanometer and how the uh, transistor behavior can change over time. And that's really important because if you're running something at you know, a couple gigahertz in a seven nanometer process in a big honking chip, and one part is running at a couple gigahertz all the time, other parts aren't, those transistors within the chip are gonna age differently. That's gonna affect timing, but things might work great up until, let's say, year seven in the car, and then things start acting squirrely. What do we do about that? Uh, so those kinds of discussions are going on right now, and it's, it's not just the automotive industry. Folks like DARPA are heavily involved in this. So there are things that are going to have to change in the raw technology that goes in the product to be able to address the needs of, of, of these systems. Let's, let's roll back into some of the quality management system uh, specs here. What do people have to think about when they're, they're working with quality management here? So ISO 26262 doesn't prescribe uh, a quality management system for you. It, it gives the guidelines and whatever quality management system you do, whether it's your own internal one, will have to be compliant with those guidelines. However, there already exist some uh, quality management system, systems in, in the world that may help you. And there's documentation and specifications and training that can help you. One of them is Automotive Spice. Uh, this is a lot on the software side of things. Uh, the tier ones, so these are the people that semiconductor vendors supply to, are all very familiar with uh, 16949. Um, in our particular case, uh, we're a semiconductor IP vendor, uh, we do CMMI dev, and uh, this is because it provides more guidance for when you're developing hardware and developing software. So it's more useful for us in that direction. You're sort of sitting at the epicenter of where all the IP comes together. What do you see that goes wrong with that? Ah, the big thing that happens, and this is with any complex uh, system, is when you're integrating IP from a whole bunch of different sources, internal and external sources, 
And we see a lot of that because we're the interconnect. So when people are integrating all of their IP into a chip, uh, we're the thing they're integrating to. Um, if there's really good upfront planning, really good communication between the teams, uh, it's a smoother process. Where things can get um, more hectic is when there's not as much um, common understanding of the overall system. What happens on the tools, the uh, traceability of the tools? So one of the things is that I talked before about in ISO 26262, how we have to look at you know, market requirements, product requirements, um, and the safety requirements within that, how that goes into the specifications and on what, all the way down through implementation, verification, uh, software test, and QA. Uh, to keep all of that in sync and have not just forward traceability, but backward traceability, you make a change in the product up here, you need to go back and change the spec for that product. Oh, well, in the past, we'd never do that. The spec would live for a certain case. Well, not never, but usually you wouldn't do it. Spec would be something. we go do implementation and make some changes along the way and in um, ECOs and what have you. And then we go shut the chip, and we never go back and change the spec or the requirements. Well, now you have to do that. But how do you know you need to do that? That's where traceability tools help. You're talking about certification here. Do the individual pieces have to be certified? Does the process have to be certified? Do the uh, engineers have to be certified? Is it all the above? So for ISO 26262, uh, you don't need to get any third-party certifications. Uh, you can basically self-certify to your customer and say, yeah, I'm in accordance with ISO 26262 for whatever. And it's up to your customer to assess and check that out. However, our customers are pretty smart, whether they're the semiconductor vendors, whether they're the tier ones, whether they're the OEMs. And so they're usually gonna want some kind of proof that you've had some training on your team or in the case of a quality management system that you're using it. Now the good thing is, is there are certification bodies uh, for these different quality management systems uh, and they use different terminologies as far as audits, assessment, certification, but in any case it's a third party coming in and looking at how you do things. Um, that's just a piece of paper, but it does give some confidence for, for the customer who's uh, working with you to say, okay, yeah, these guys know what they're doing. Having said that, they are still going to do their own assessment of you. If you have the piece of paper and you're, you're demonstrating to them that you are doing things in the proper manner, that assessment might not be as deep as if you're totally new to this, you haven't gone through any training, individual training, you haven't gone through any uh, uh, process implementation, quality process implementation, and you haven't gone through any third-party certification. There's a lot of moving pieces here, though. Do the certifications change pretty regularly? Do you have to update them on a regular basis? Uh, the certifications are usually good for a set time period. Um, for uh, things like personal uh, trainings, it's, it's usually for about three years. Uh, for processes, it could be for a year or a um, or year to three years. It depends on the, on the certifying body that, that you deal with. Um, for products, it's a little bit different. So for products, we'll talk about this in a minute, but when you're looking at a semiconductor or semiconductor IP, you're looking at something that is a, it's technically it's not a system. It's a safety element out of context. You don't necessarily know how it's going to be used. So you have assumptions of use. So you, your product, that particular version of the product will be certified for a particular set of assumptions of use. Obviously the most, most interesting part of this whole thing for a lot of people is the product. What, happens there what what are, what are the gotchas what do you have to know about and and what do people need to, to to know in order to move forward with this and actually get their products accepted into cars cool. well the important thing to realize is before you even get to the product as i said before your customer is going to look at how how you've created the product and who has created the product and if you don't have those bases covered um properly and you don't rate uh raise their confidence with what you've done that is going to affect the confidence in the, your analysis of your own product. So keep that in mind. And when I talk about analysis, what you need to determine for you and your team is how much of that safety analysis you want to do on your own and how much you want to involve an external third party. So if you're newer to automotive, newer to functional safety products, you're definitely going to want to get um, a great relationship with a qualified a functional safety consultancy who can help you with that. And then, as I mentioned before, what's interesting about the analysis 
uh, for semiconductors and semiconductor IP is the aspect that it's not a complete system. Uh, there's no sensor uh, brain and actuator in this. And semiconductors were usually dealing, the complex semiconductors are usually dealing with just the brain part. Um, so it's a safety element out of context. And in the specification, you actually have to make a whole bunch of different assumptions before you even get to the analysis of how this is going to be used by your customers. So that's something that's very important there. The next thing is, is these are then ingredients into the deliverables that you're going to have to your customers. So there's going to be an analysis that you do based on statement of, hey, these are the huge amount of assumptions I'm making about this particular product. And the deliverables you're going to have is a safety manual, uh, your failure modes and effects and diagnostic analysis. And everybody says FMEDA, FMEDA. Very important. Um, what is also important is to confirm um, basically your math in that FMEDA and uh, uh, ensure that the safety mechanisms that you've created in your product behave as intended. And that's what fault injection is about. So your, your failure mode analysis is uh, not just the failure mode of the chip, it's a failover in case something goes wrong too, right? That depends. And this is where we get in the discussion of ASLs. So these are automotive safety integrity levels. And so for something that's an autonomous driving vehicle or something that um, uh, has a huge safety effect where if it either acts when it shouldn't or doesn't act when it should, it could kill you, that's ASL D. So in a lot of these very complex chips, that's what we're dealing with is ASL D. If you're dealing with infotainment chips, uh, you know, for dashboard clusters, things like that, you're looking at usually ASL B. So the requirements within the system are not that bad. It can be fine to, hey, reboot. Whereas ASIL D, it's not like that. Is it changing as we go forward? Because some of the chips that are designed for the infotainment system suddenly may be connected now into other parts of the car. Yes, and that's one of the things that's really, really important to understand. Uh, when it comes to um, determining the ASILs, it's really from the standpoint of the, the tier one, it's, it's a systems engineering analysis to say, hey, what are the um, dependencies within this? What information, let's say coming from an infotainment cluster, is there any information that that then puts into a critical safety system that the safety, safety system uh, makes decisions on? If that information is corrupted, what happens to the car as a result of that? So that analysis goes on at a system level. Um, with, from the semiconductor standpoint, we usually don't deal with it too much at that level. How do you get the certified and what's the real value of that certification? So getting your product certified, uh, as I talked about before, you're going to have some assumptions of use around how this thing is used. You're going to have a whole bunch of analysis. You're going to have a set of deliverables. The certifying body, the third party that you go to, uh, this could be a company like Exceda, SGS2 SAR, uh, Sued. Uh, these companies will come in and they are actually going to look at not just the product, they're going to look at your people, they're going to look at the processes you use to create the product, they're going to look at your deliverables, they're going to look at your analyses, they're even going to look at your assumptions of use to say, hey, does this really match what we expect this company's customers to need? And from that, they're going to create the certification. When they create the certification, it's going to be in compliance with ISO 26262 for a certain ASIL level. So it could be A, B, C, D, or actually QM if there's no, um, if there's no safety requirements uh, for that product. Now having said all that, you, you get this nice piece of paper and it says, hey, you're certified for ASIL D for this particular product. Well, your customer's still going to, they're going to look at that paper, but they're also they're still going to do their internal assessment. They're functional safety people are going to come and look at you from a process and product standpoint and still ask you a lot of questions about how you got to the numbers and maybe even come back to you and say, hey, where are you, we're using your product a little differently than what you have in your assumptions of use. We want you to reanalyze some things based on how we're going to use your product. So the work is never done even if you do have third-party certifications. And that's for whether it's th third-party certifications for people, for your processes, or for your actual products. Kurt Schuller, thanks for a great update on what's going on with ISO 26262. Thanks, Ed.